So, you know, canal company boatmen face a difficult dilemma during the, during the Civil War era. Canal boats were privately owned, that is, they weren't owned by the canal company. They were owned by individuals, perhaps families, or small businesses. In many cases, probably those families or individuals took out mortgages to have their boats made, so their entire livelihoods were tied up in their boats. Uh, when the Confederates occupied Harper's Ferry in, in uh, the spring and summer of 1861, initially they stopped boating. They, they posted sentinels along the canal towpath. Um, when the VMI professor, Thomas Jonathan Jackson, took command of Harper's Ferry, he required canal boats to obtain passes before they could take their boats by Harper's Ferry. And just looking at uh, canal company records of tolls collected, it's, it's clear that few boats, boatmen were willing to take their boats by Harper's Ferry. They were unwilling to risk their entire livelihoods by having their, perhaps having their boats or their cargoes seized. And we do know that at least two boats were seized by the Confederates, uh, boats uh, hauling grain and another one uh, hauling salt. When the Confederates evacuated Harper's Ferry, uh, boating was resumed in, uh, in, the, in uh, August, late August of 1861. In early September, a boatman was mortally wounded in some crossfire opposite Shepherdstown. There's two different accounts of what one describes the, the uh, boatman as a tow boy who was killed. started for Knott's Mill on the Potomac and then went to within half a mile of the river where we stopped for the night in a barn. Next morning, leaving one man to take care of the horses, we entered a ravine which led down to the mill and having hidden the men in the thicket, I crawled to the brow of the cliff to take a survey and had not long been in that position before I saw five men come down to a skiff four getting in while the other ensconced himself behind a tree to keep watch. I went back and told this to the boys, and it was with difficulty they could be restrained from rushing down and firing into the boat, all being privates, each wished to have his own way about the matter, but I threatened to shoot the first man that disobeyed me, and in that way I controlled them. I now divided my squad, sending four men up the river to cut off their retreat in that direction while I started to go round the bluff with Welch, Kemp, and Orison. In endeavoring to cross the road to get behind a stone fence, the guard across the river discovered us and fired, the ball striking the bank just behind my back. No time was now to be lost, so calling to the men to follow, we ran down the road and jumped over the yard wall of a house that stood there when three out of the four who had got into the building fired on us, but fortunately without effect. Before they could reload, I was in the house with a bowie knife and revolver, and they all escaped by the back way, and I could not follow them on that side. As I now saw, there was a company drawn up on the other bank of the river with their pieces leveled. I passed under cover, however, to the lower corner of the house, and at that moment, one of them, a sergeant, jumped into the boat and pushed off. I had three shots at him, each cutting his clothes. He then plunged into the water, came ashore, and hid under the bank. By this time, another had gained the boat and fired at me, the ball knocking off a piece of weatherboard close to my head. With deliberate aim, then, I fired, and as the rifle cracked, he fell, wounded into the mud. The ball had taken effect in the back part of his neck. He also crawled out and got under the bank. About 200 yards below the dwelling was a small log hut. Welch had chased one of them into it, but owing to the incessant firing from the other side of the river, could not follow him. Knowing that we must act promptly, I ran the gauntlet to the back part of the hut where there were two windows and struck one of them with the butt of my rifle. At the second stroke, it gave way and fell to the inside. The fellow within then fired, and the ball passed so near my head that I felt the burn of it. It was my turn next. 
but on thrusting my rifle through the window, I found that an exploded cap prevented the revolution of the cylinder, and before I could recover the weapon, he seized it by the barrel and tried to wrest it from me. He was very strong, but I got it away and he surrendered. I made him crawl through the window with his musket, which I stood up against the house with my own rifle. Then, taking him by the collar, I led him down to the river and made him shout out to the company on the other side, Cease firing! And at the same time, I threatened to kill every man of them on our side of the river if another shot was fired. Holding before me as a shield the man I had captured by the collar with the muzzle of a pistol to his head, I reached the river bank and discovered the two who had left the boat concealed among the roots of an underwashed tree. I made them come forth, and with the corporal who had surrendered four and all, we hurried to our horses, put them up behind the men, and returned to camp. The boatmen uh, usually went to protect themselves, their livelihoods, they would just refuse freight, that is, refuse the boat. For example, in uh, late 1863, there were a number of raids across the border. A cow company official in Cumberland wrote that the boatmen were tying up, refusing freight until the border was made more secure. Uh, similarly, in late 1864, there was a 25 mile gap in, in the, the pickets along the Potomac in Montgomery County, Maryland. And the cow boatmen got word of this and they simply tied up and refused to proceed unless they were given a military escort. So that's the tactics that the boatmen used to try to protect themselves and their livelihoods.